Okay, so before I start talking about what I want to talk about today, I just want to uh, draw attention to this lovely figure Frank made this morning. Um, this really says a lot, so I hope you have this down somewhere. Um, by the end of Thursday, hopefully, we'll add a third column to this table, basically. And we'll get to say what all of these things are in, in categories. So that's what we have to look forward to. But before we get there, we have to talk about, um, well, today's topic is behavioral reasoning, but I have a couple things to finish up from last time, so I'm going to do that. So if you recall, uh, last time we defined what a functor was. And the idea was that functors should be morphisms between categories. Right? So because a morphism should be, at least morally, right, some kind of structure preserving path, we ask ourselves, what is the structure of a category that should be preserved? And it's exactly this. So if you remember a functor has a domain, a co-domain category, and then it has to tell you what to do with the object, and you give a little subscript zero for the object map there, and it has to tell you what to do with the arrow, so you give a little subscript one to the arrow map, and then this has to uh, respect the structure of a category. So first of all, it has to respect the boundary. So if you send an arrow over by the functor, then the domain of the image of the arrow should be the image of the domain of the arrow, right? Like this. And similarly to the codomain. And then finally, it should respect what I've been calling the composition structure. And I've been encouraging you to think about this in this um, unbiased way, but the, the sort of typical way is the biased way, where we tell what to do with nullary compositions, which are identities. So if you send an identity over, then you should get an identity. And here's this binary composition. So if you send a composite of two arrows over by the functor, then you should get the functor images of the, the composition of the functor images, right? So the point is, it doesn't matter whether you first did the composition in the domain and then send the whole thing over, or if you send the parts over and then you do the composition in the codomain. Um, and because these subscripts are kind of fiddly, we'll stop writing them, we'll just drop the subscripts. So the dimension which we're working will be clear from the context, whether F is being applied to an object or being applied to an arrow, we'll just call it F. Okay, so in functional programming languages, this is sometimes called like F map or something, but this part is called F map, so we'll just call both things the name of the function. Okay, so that's where we were. So since we want functors the morphisms of categories, we have to talk about their composition structure in turn. So we have the composition structure of functors. So in order to specify this, I have to tell you what is an identity functor. and then what is a binary composition of functors. So the easiest way to do this is to draw a diagram. So if I have an identity functor on a category C, then I'm going to draw you a diagram in C. A very small diagram. And it should transport this to, well, back to C. And what should it do? Well, it should just apply the identity function to all of the components. So in other words, it should send the A to A, B to B, and F to F. Okay. Well, this is an identity functor, right? So the domain and codomain are the same. So the categories are the same. So this is a little diagram in the category C. This is another little diagram in the category C. And they're the same diagram because the identity functor just applies the identity function to everything in sight. Okay, so then we have to say what a uh, composition of functors is. And 
Again, I'm going to do this uh, diagrammatically. So if I have two functors, uh, then, uh, okay, so say F, say I start in the category C, and I have, again, this little diagram, and I apply the functor F to it that takes me to the category D, then here I will have the F image of A, the F image of B, and the F image of the arrow. And now I want to compose that with the functor G, which takes us to another category, E, let's say. And then what should we get here? Well, we should just get G of F of A. So the point is that composition of functors just composes the corresponding functions at both the object and the arrow level, right? Okay, so um, using this information, we can conclude that if we have some collection of categories that we now think of as objects, and some collection of functors among them, and then we take all the paths that we can build out of those functors, and we make those arrows. And then we consider identity functors to be identity arrows, and functor composition to be arrow composition. Then we can create a category where the objects are those categories that we started with, and the arrows are the paths and the functors. So we can describe categories of categories. But if we try to do, if we try to sort of get our ahead of ourselves and describe the category of all categories, we run into some foundational problems, and they're very similar to the foundational problems we run into if we try to describe the set of all sets. So we have to be a little bit careful. And so we'll have to briefly consider matters of size. But I don't want this to be a course on foundation, so I'm going to try pretty lightly in this realm. Uh, the issues are pretty much the same as come up in set theory. But the slogan is, the size does matter. <laughs> but as long as we're, we're not too ambitious, then everything works out fine. Okay, so the story here is that um, If I have a collection, and I have a collection that I apply the adjective small to, then that means I'm just talking about a set. Okay? So a small collection is just another word for set. Small means has some cardinality, if you want to think of it that way. So if I have a category that's small, Then I mean that its arrow collection is small. I mean a set. Okay. So we have a category of small categories. Sets with little identity moves, if you want it, on that way. 
Okay, but now if we take the collection of all sets, Russell has already taught us that that's too big to be a set, right? And so the objects of Cat contain at least those, so it's already too big to be a set. So Cat is not an object in Cat. Okay, but typically we don't, or well, in many cases we don't care whether the category is small or not small, sort of in the large globally, we say, but only whether the HOM collections are sets. So the category C is locally small, if all the HOMs are small, that is, if they're sets, Right? And most of the categories that you can plausibly think of turn out to be locally small. So in particular, set is locally small, cat is locally small, and all the ones we've met so far. So from this point forward, I will stop saying hum collection and start saying hum set, if I haven't already slipped and done it already. Um, and we will assume, unless I say otherwise, which I don't think I will, that every category that we use locally small. Okay, and that's pretty much all I want to say about the use of foundations and size. Okay. Um, if each home, okay, so what I mean is, if for every A and B, the set of arrows from A to B is this, this is the name of a set of arrows whose domain is A and whose codomain is B. Or I just said set, sorry. A collection of arrows, I have to backtrack. And if, in every case, for each A and each B, this collection of arrows is a set, then C is locally small. Okay. So that, that's the idea of local. It means that there might be too many objects in the category for the category to be small. But if you look at any pair of objects and just consider the arrows between them, then that is set. Okay, so the, the fact that set sort of is where the hom, if you want to think of hom as sort of a function, right, that takes two objects and gives you some collection, that, that the codomain of hom in small categories is set, that fact gives set sort of um, a special position in, in category theory. So if we fix an object, say x, in a locally small category c, then we can define a function that takes any object a in the category and maps it to the hum set, now I'm allowed to say set, x, Okay. Right. So you give me an object, and I give you back all the arrows from X to the object that you gave me. But this construction extends to a function, by which I mean we can define it also on arrows, and it obeys the laws for being a function. So the way that I'll explain this is like this. I name the functor C X zero blank. Right? This is the name. And now I tell you its type. So its domain is the category C, and its codomain is the category set. And now I have to tell you its action on objects. So I, I already told you that. It takes an object A and it sends it to the home set X to A. And now I have to tell you what it does on arrows. And what it does is, well, the name we give it is rather uninformative, but it's this. And this is, means take the argument and post-compose it with F. Right? So this goes from A, oh, I'm sorry, X to A, sorry, X to Right? So you 
give me an arrow from x to a, I compose f with it, and I end up with an arrow from x to b. So this is just syntactic sugar for lambda of an arrow, and then you take that arrow and you compose it with f. Does that make sense? The idea is really simple. It's just you give me something, if it's an object, then I put it in this slot. If it's an arrow, then I turn it into a function that takes arrows from the domain object that you give me into arrows from x to the codomain object that you give me by just composing it with the arrow that. Okay. <clears throat> and now to check that this thing is a functor, right, what do we have to do? Well, we already checked that it respects boundaries. We've got a little squish, but that's what this bit here says. And then we have to check that it respects the composition structure. So how do we do that? We have to check that if I put in an identity arrow here, that this is the identity function on this set. And for the composition, we have to check that if I put in a composite here, that this is the composition of functions We can do something similar in categories. We can build a category whose component objects and arrows and identities and compositions are all built out of ordered pairs of the respective things from two categories. So in categories, uh, I'm going to say here small to make this a little less tricky. We can define the product. Given, well, okay, so given categories C and D, then C cross D has, and now I have to tell you that long list of objects, 
But I told you the idea is that everything is just in order of pairs. So C cross D object set is just the object set of C cross, now this is this cross in set, right? The object set of D. And likewise arrows, the same. Arrow set of the product is the product now in sets of the arrow sets, uh, such that uh, we have the respect of boundaries. So if we have a boundary map applied to a pair of arrows, uh, this. So F is an arrow from C, and P is an arrow from D. Then this is the pair of the boundary applied to F, and the same boundary applied to P. <coughs> and then the identities and compositions are just what you would expect. I have, if I want to take the identity of a pair of objects, one from C and one from D, then I just take the pair of arrows so the identity arrow on a pair of objects is the pair of identity arrows 